Each year, 40 million kids in North America register to play a sport. 40 million. 70% of those kids will quit their sport before the age of 13. That's seven out of every 10 kids finished, gone, done, out. I'm an athlete development expert. I'm the father of two sport-obsessed boys. I've coached for over 20 years and have consulted over 50 organizations from grassroots to the professional and Olympic levels of sport. I've seen the impact of kids quitting sport firsthand. Why are they quitting? Adults, parents, coaches, and administrators are sucking the spontaneity, independence, and fun from kids' sport. Pass by any playground, and you'll see kids experiencing the joy and wonder of movement. They're having fun. Left alone, kids form teams based on fairness. They understand that where there's no balance, there's no fun. And fun is what kids' sport is all about. For the kids, by the kids. Enter the adults. They see this prepubescent playground potential and steal control. They prioritize their wants first. They break the kids into two groups, house team and elite team. Parents show up with lawn chairs and bullhorns, yell instructions at their kids, and heckle the 11-year-old official. The elite team destroys the house team until the kids in the house team quit. There's no fun or learning in winning or losing by a lopsided margin. With nobody left to pummel, the adults come up with an Einstein idea, a stroke of genius. We'll take our elite 5 to 10-year-old team and challenge other elite 5 to 10-year-old teams in the district. This way, we can crown a champion and our future Hall of Famer won't fall behind. And when we win at that level, we'll organize a national championship, perhaps at Disneyland. Many parents think their kids' performance is a reflection on themselves. Something that placement on a house team will adversely affect their social status. So they pay extra for coaching, personal trainers, hoodies, ball caps, and backpacks. All smoke and mirrors confirmation of elite status. And with that increase in investment comes an increase in expectation, usually in the form of parents saying, I'm paying all this money and that's how you show up? Because being a member of the elite team demands a serious commitment. An extra hour of practice every evening, four to five hours on the weekend, and no less than five showcases, formerly called tournaments, per season. And don't even think about playing another sport or having another hobby, because there's no time for that. As the demands and the cost of being on the elite team rise, the number of kids who can play and afford to play drops. But don't worry, we can just get another elite six-year-old to enter the playground transfer portal and join our team. Nobody, nobody, and I mean nobody under 15 years old is elite. Elite is when you're heads and shoulders above the highest performing talent at the highest level of sport. Christine Sinclair, elite soccer. LeBron James, elite basketball. Serena Williams is elite in tennis. And Michael Phelps was elite in swimming. The term elite used at the grassroots level of sport is done to leverage parent ego and FOMO, fear of missing out. It really serves one purpose. Take your money. Seriously, I've traveled around the world and asked top-ranked coaches and officials, what makes elite players? And their answers are similar. 35% is genetic predisposition. Athletes' parents are both 6'5", and they're 6'9", and athletic. They're going to have a distinct advantage in sport where height matters, like basketball and volleyball. 25% comes from an internal drive. The athlete hits 1,000 balls against the wall every night because they want to. Not because somebody told them to, not because they have to, because they want to. 20% is contingent on the right environment. Affluent neighborhood, close proximity to great facilities, two patient parents. We all know the saying, it takes a village. 15% quality coaching. Experienced, knowledgeable coaches who understand how to meet the athletes where they are and support their individual development needs. And 5% is sheer luck. The athlete was given their best performance at the right time, right place, and seen by the right person. 
Less than 2% of North American high school athletes will ever set foot in a collegiate setting. And less than 2% of that 2% will make it to the pros. Those are just slightly higher odds than getting struck by lightning or winning the lottery. <laughs> Yet, parents, coaches, and administrators in North America and beyond continue to push the 2% development pathway on 100% of the participants. Said differently, adults have transformed the joy of playing sport into the chore of working sport. And kids are dropping out in droves. Their default is less stressful environments that are leading to sedentary lifestyles and unhealthy habits. We really need to give sport back to the kids. For many kids, sport is the perfect dress rehearsal for real life. Kids solving their own problems and making their own decisions leads to better mental health. Kids remaining healthy, active, and vibrant leads to better physical health. And kids learning how to communicate and interact with one another leads to greater social competence and confidence. Youth sport has significant downstream benefits, particularly in the workforce. Studies show that sport teaches kids how to communicate together and work cohesively in groups. And this is especially true for girls and women. Fortune magazine reports that over 80% of female Fortune 500 executives played a team sport at some point in their lives. Movement, play, and sport have benefits that go beyond sport, beyond those in sport, and beyond those whose kids play sport. It benefits all of us. So here are three actions we must take to give sport back to the kids. Number one, let the kids be kids. Kids aren't small adults, they're kids. We wouldn't expect a six-year-old to solve a nuclear physics equation, and we need to dial back our expectation of kids' early performance in sport. Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000-hour mastery rule wasn't meant to be jammed between the ages of seven and 10. <laughs> and admittedly, he wasn't even talking about sport when he made the comments. Proficiency and mastery take time, repetition, and patience. They also require that kids make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. We're either winning or we're learning. In over 20 years as a coach, I've seen the negative impacts adults can have on kids. Parents pushing their kids out of sport because it becomes too much pressure. Coaches turning kids off sport because of their abusive, win-at-all-cost mentality. An administration failing to recognize and pivot to the needs of the next generation. There's only three questions adults should ask kids at the end of every game and season. Are you having fun? Are you working at improving your skills? And are you excited to come back and play next game or next season? Let the kids be kids. Second action, see something, say something. We wouldn't tolerate the levels of abuse we see in youth sport in any other facet of society. Can you imagine standing by while an adult berated or abused your kid under the guise of toughening them up? Or paying for products and services with no clear breakdown of where your money's going? Or being told your kid can only take one class if they wish to attend this school? Yet we do this in sport all the time. We toe the line based on a fear of repercussion. Like if we challenge the leadership, our kids will suffer. Well, they're already suffering. And we don't just say something when we see something wrong happening to our kid. We need to speak up when we see something wrong happening to any kid. And I'm guilty. I watched an adult coach berate a 15-year-old night after night after night until he eventually quit the sport disconnected from his peer group, and dropped from honor roll to absent from school. He turned to drugs and one night overdosed on the floor of a McDonald's restaurant. It happened over one season, and it can happen that fast. Fortunately, he survived, but he's now going to have to manage his addiction for the rest of his life. Not what kids sign up for. I heard adults make excuses for the coach. I listened to some parents say, thank God that wasn't my kid. 
And at the end of the season, five other kids who also experienced the same level of abuse quit the sport. Not the team, the sport. And since then, I've been saying something when I see something that's not right. Third action. Restructure the industry. Youth sport is the only $28 billion a year annual industry operating with no CEO. And history shows that any power without constraint usually ends in abuse. And in youth sport, it has. Youth sport should operate like any successful franchise business with a clearly defined operating system and checks and balances that hold people accountable to doing the right things. Governing bodies need to create and distribute volunteer training programs so that every single adult who comes in contact with a kid understands their role and responsibility in doing the right thing. Every sport organization in the world has an obligation to ensure that the over 40 million kids who register to play each year have a fantastic sport experience. The Icelandic coaching ethos, as many as possible, as long as possible, in the best environments possible. Imagine that was the mission statement for every sport organization. Sport management hierarchies are stifling progress. We need to flatten them. The Australian Cycling Federation reorganized itself from 18 boards with 130 directors and 11 CEOs to one board, 12 directors, and one CEO, thus freeing up more time, energy, and investment directly to the athletes. It can be done. Let kids be kids, see something, say something, restructure the industry. Think about how these three actions can help you, your community, or someone you know in giving sport back to the kids. Pass by any playground and you'll see kids experiencing the joy and wonder of movement. They're having fun. They're creating friendships and unknowingly developing critical life skills. We must see youth sport as the valuable tool for human development that it is and prioritize the wants of the kids before the adults. We're only moving sport forward when we give it back to the kids. Give it back.